If there was a list, a chart of some sorts, that combines the ingredients for the perfect Resident Evil experience, what would you choose to include? Depending on which entry in the series entices you the most, the answers may vary and you might choose different elements. For the classic experience, survival fundamentals are an essential requisite. Things like limited saves, limited inventory, getting poisoned, trapped, or maybe you're a bit short on ammo and meds. In addition, having several paths to explore that are connected in some way is another part, allowing you the freedom to explore and prioritize different tasks while backtracking to previous locations for completing unfinished businesses. And maybe I'll add in a bit more intangible things like suspense, which is propelled by the fixed camera angles, an atmosphere that is intensified by the pre-rendered backgrounds. Now for the median titles, there seems to be a focus on varying the locations, unlike the classic titles which focused on confined areas like the police station and the Spencer mansion, the newer titles usually swap the environments every mission or so, pivoting from the central exploration system and focusing on a more linear progression. At best, constantly changing the environment adds a widespread of aesthetic variety that keeps you engaged and attentive. At worst, the game feels undirected towards its purpose, where the pacing feels somewhat random. In addition to area swapping, the middle entries had evolved their shooting and fighting mechanics to a more access-based perspective, which went hand-in-hand -in, -hand in making the game rely on action more heavily to keep the players on edge. And jumping on to the modern titles, I'll start with a cinematic depiction of the events that is experienced at first hand due to the first-person perspective. Furthermore, the modern RE experience shifted the fear factor to a more paranormal and occult approach, while still preserving some of the survival aspects the classic titles had. And eventually, all the games in the series have shared aspects and characteristics like puzzle solving being a bit cheesy with horrifying narratives. So now, Choosing the preferred components from all the entries in the franchise should produce the ultimate Resident Evil experience. I mean, imagine a game that has a bit of everything I've mentioned previously. On paper, that would be called Veronica X. In reality, it is the somewhat poorly thought out budget version of these attributes. While I still love, enjoy, and would recommend Code Veronica to every Resident Evil fan and survival horror fans in general, it's no secret that the game has its issues. On the surface level, these range from soft lock to mindless backtracking and questionable voice acting. Hey, wait up! If I let you see, you're gonna scare the shit out of you. But it extends a bit more in depth on where it falls short and where it delivers, stuck in limbo between having one of the best narratives in the franchise, along with delivering a concise gameplay loop and stagnation by aimlessly wandering around carrying unnecessarily half-baked items. This is called Veronica X. X, 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 X. <laughs> I'm keeping that in, I don't care. Anyways, the game starts after the events of Resident Evil 2, where Claire infiltrates an Umbrella facility in Paris looking for her brother, Chris, who she thinks was captured by Umbrella. The mission fails where Claire gets captured and sent to another Umbrella facility on the Rockford Island, who's owned by the Ashford family, which they'll be the center of the narrative for most of the game. So, after waking up in a cell to the sound of a combat zone going down, we meet an Umbrella guard by the name of Rodrigo, who is seemingly injured and let us walk free after explaining that the island has been seized by unknown mercenaries and all hell broke loose. The dimly lit underground jail room reeks of dreadful atmosphere, with a simplistic yet effective sound design composed of reverbed footsteps and water drops. And after ignoring the second best knife in the franchise following RE2 remake, Claire surges from the underground to a petrifying graveyard where she's surrounded by undead zombies rising from the grave. It sets the game on path for being the greatest Resident Evil of all time. And then we meet this dude. Wait, wait, oui, oui. don't shoot. Ah, it's beautiful. I don't want you following me, lady. Slow me down. Now, if you've played this game or watched any videos regarding it, you know that calling this character quote-unquote poorly written is a colossal understatement. Aside from being an annoying cornball who's horrendously voice acted, 
Steve somehow transforms what was supposed to be relatable, traumatic events into an overly dramatic cliches that I couldn't be more apathetic about. A common rebuttal for this argument is that he's only a 17-year-old teenager who's coping the loss of his family. But even then, why would you write an immature character that we're supposed to connect with in a mainly adults game with a mature narrative? It just feels detached and out of place. Do you want me to take care of this for you, little boy? Moving on to a more charming detail the game integrates, where I've found this journal in an ominous prison camp written by an unknown prisoner, which details that the prisoner's buddy, Bob, in the bunk below him told the craziest story about how he used to be an attendant for the head of this place, Alfred, and got placed here for a tiny little mistake. And one night, without warning, a group of military men took Bob to the building behind the guillotine stand, where these large plastic bags are being consistently removed from the site and after sneaking out to observe the action, all he could hear was the haunting sound of Bob's screams along with a psychotic laughter. And after everyone else got dragged to the same location, the unknown prisoner is left by himself in the darkness, knowing he's next. Later on in the game, I've got access to the mentioned building, and as soon as I walked in, a dark and ambient theme starts playing. getting to witness the horrific experiments that was previously foretold, and learning about the anatomist's depraved psyche that turned his experiments into a demonic ritual, aided by the devil that never leaves his mind. I just love this type of foreshadowing, where you learn or read about something and get to experience the events and their aftermath later on. An underrated art form in building suspense, which this game does a great job of. So, after killing some zombies, solving a 3D printer puzzle that was way ahead of its time, and watching Steve throw another hissy fit... No way. He won't come. You'll just end up disappointed if you rely on others. Believe me, I know! What was that all about? It's time to get out of the prison. And I have to say, this area does its job pretty well as a starting level, in terms of location, tone, and objectives. But being the first Resident Evil to have fully rendered 3D backgrounds, it struggles to fill the void of space, making the vacant whereabouts feel a bit bland, especially on the outdoors. Thankfully, the upcoming areas do a better job at finessing the hardware limitations, constructing a more complete and vibrant-looking design. Reaching a crossroads between three-ish areas, I've headed for the palace where the plot starts building up towards a dark history that has been kept a secret for over a decade. These are Alfred and Alexia Ashford, a genetically engineered twins produced by an umbrella geneticist, Alexander Ashford, after the death of his father, Edward, who was one of the higher-ups at Umbrella. Alexander feared for his position in the corporation against the other Umbrella rivalries and so he created the embryo that manifest his great-great-grandmother, Veronica Ashford, the first countess, which was renowned for her remarkable combination of intellect and beauty. The synthetic egg split into twins, giving birth to Alfred, who had an above-average intelligence, and Alexia, the intended breed, with almost superhuman qualities and intellect, as she's set to regain the Ashford's position and honor in Umbrella and beyond. Being born into a strict environment to discipline their education, the twins built a grim and outright inappropriate relationship. And here is where we get to meet the male seed, Alfred Ashford, who is currently in charge of the Rockford Island. He clashes with Claire thinking she has a hand in the invasion of his base, and it's clear that he suffers a shaky mental state with illusions of grandeur. The Ashford family is among the world's first and finest. My grandfather is one of the original founders of Umbrella Inc. So he decides to spare Claire for the moment in order to cage her in his sick games for entertainment. Although the palace is relatively small in size and limited in exploration, I still love how untraditional its rooms are. You have a war-themed showroom, 
a casino-themed bar, and an eerie office with a secret passage to Alfred's castle. The palace conveys what could have been astonishing if it was fully fleshed out, but instead this game takes the, mm, I don't wanna say the quantity over quality approach, because these areas are amazing, but they're like a mini version of what's possible, suppressing their potential, where the palace feels like a second-class Spencer mansion from Resident Evil 1, foreshadowing the implementation of this game design philosophy in the upcoming entries, which to be fair, since then it had been greatly improved in design, details, and pacing, but overall, I admire how the palace turned out to be in the face of the constrictions met while developing it. Blending a bit awkwardly with the palace is the underwater facility. Well, to be accurate, the access is through an underwater submarine, which after it proceeds to an aircraft of some sorts, making the level feel a bit incoherent, but still visually pleasing. And much like the rest of the levels in this game, I've got to backtrack this area multiple times, which I'm more than happy to do, since it introduces new dimensions to the playground, but it gets annoying when it's gimmicky, where some tasks feel like unnecessary chores, like using the square-based valve handle, and having to remodify its base to an octagon shape to use it, then find and attach a socket extension that turns it back to a square-based handle. It just feels like a poorly thought out through fillers. So, after rescuing Rodrigo from bleeding out with a hemostatic medicine, we get to learn the reason that brings Steve to this island. Turns out that his father used to be an umbrella employee who tried to steal the company's secrets and sell it to the highest bidder. He got caught by Umbrella who captured and killed his wife, where now Steve is sent here looking for his father, hoping for a sign of life unveiling a worse fate where the release of the virus had caught up to him, leaving him a brainless undead like the rest of the island. Steve gets cold feet pulling the trigger on his old man, but decides to do the necessary after witnessing Claire's life being put on the line. In hindsight, this event would seem to root his affection for Claire as seen later in the game. After all, he traded the life of the last of his loved ones for hers making her the scapegoat, not for his malice or vengeance, but as a reason to fight for after the quote-unquote martyring of his father. The military training facility can be satisfyingly daunting at the first playthrough and is considerably more sophisticated in its layout and objectives. It seems to present something new at every corner, ranging from new enemies like the gulp worm, albanoid infant, hunter, sweeper, etc. New items like the lockpick which unlocks new points of interest all over the map, new weapons and weapon parts, and even dynamic changes later in the game that rework certain areas by wrecking up a path or blowing up a new one. It just kept me engaged in a sense of, you know where in games you reach certain checkpoints that concludes a specific part of the game where you feel like, okay, I've finished this section, I'll save and resume playing in another session. I've never had this feeling going through the training facility. It blends its points of interest together very smoothly that every sector feels connected to the end goal of the level. Backtracking from the military facility to the palace inside Alfred's office, hidden behind an antique mechanical clock, is a secret passage to Alfred's private residence along with his twin sister Alexia. According to his secretary, Robert Dawson, who's been serving Sir Alfred for four years, says that Alfred shows no leniency towards him or the other employees in regards of prying on his personal life with Alexia. Occasionally, Robert would spot a silhouette of who seems to be Alexia, but after asking Alfred about his sightings, it would seem to enrage him to a life-threatening extent. So why is all the information around his private life with Alexia seems to be strictly confidential? What is he trying to hide? Snooping around the residence, Claire hears a conversation between the twins, spotting Alexia having a conversation with an out-of-sight Alfred, arguing about the inconvenience of Claire's supposed invasion of the island, and how it is hampering the course of their plan to revive the Ashford's family name. A while later, Alexia confronts Claire with a sniper rifle only for the encounter to be interrupted by Steve, saving Claire by exchanging fire with Alexia, who runs off to a secret doorway passage between the twins' rooms, following her to the other side where a blood trail seems to be leading to a blonde wig. Upon inspection, Alfred jumps out of a high ceiling bed to eliminate the couple. But after sensing an awkward stare by Claire and Steve, Alfred gets startled by feeling like the elephant in the room and quickly gazes upon the mirror behind him, only to unveil his face, contoured by makeup, resembling the appearance of his sisters more than his, 
leading him to storm out of the room in panic, realizing that he had been impersonating his sister's character all along. Why and how? Going back in time to the twins at a young age, where the young prodigy Alexia had injected her father Alexander with the T. Veronica virus, after finding out the truth about how she and her brother were synthetically conceived as a chess move to regain the family's power rank. Alexander had been locked away deep in the underground where his mutation process had begun immediately. Afterwards, Alexia had decided to pick up the pieces of the T. Veronica virus research where she refined the formula and developed a procedure that would utilize the virus's full potential after administration. This included a 15 years period of cryogenic sleep after injection, which avoids the immediate mutation by giving the virus a sufficient time window to fully adapt to the host's body. Going forward with the experiment by making herself the test subject gave her brother Alfred 15 years of seclusion. Considering she was his second half, only companion and lover as he confesses in a letter found at the upper floors of the residence. 15 years of holding things down in mental isolation, along with the stress of his leadership roles and responsibilities, has broke down his psyche, fabricating a new reality that reunites him with his cherished ones by developing dissociative identity disorder that allows him to play both roles of him and his sister. The residence offers a different type of horror, close to what can be found in games like Alone in the Dark and Silent Hill, where it provokes unease more than immediate danger. This design choice suffers from a bit of inconsistency, since the makeover is carried out solely by the setting of the level and not the combat approach, where the initial intrigue of the paranormal fright is abruptly disrupted by the traditional zombies with the same old combat loop. Even though this level would have greatly benefited from removing all enemies and letting the ominous house decorations provide the fear factor. Or maybe introduce a stalker type of enemy who follows you around the residence later on when revisiting the area. Now that would be sick. But they know their game way better than I do and ultimately they did a fantastic job with this level regardless. After solving some puzzles and collecting a few items, Claire heads to the airport along with Steve to prepare a getaway via plane where Claire gets into a warm-up fight with a tyrant, who's been set off by Alfred as a mean to stop their escape. But the real battle takes place on the cargo plane in the hold, while the first encounter revolved around dealing enough damage to the tyrant before he backs Claire up into the flames. The second battle is more footloose and, although it offers extra space to work with, the tyrant still has a game-breaking issue, which in fighting game terms it's called quote-unquote meaty. Without context, <laughs> she. But let me give you an example of what Miri means. Let's say an opponent knocked me down to the ground. Now while I'm still on the ground, he can charge up or start an attack that will catch me as soon as I'm off the ground. So I'm basically waking up to unavoidable offense. Now in Tyrant's case, he charges up an attack that will catch Claire one second after she wakes up off the ground meaning the game gives you one second window after the wake-up animation to control Claire and avoid the attack. The problem is that when the tyrant backs you up in a confined, restricted position, the one second of control won't matter and Claire will still get hit due to being stuck in this tight spot. A reasonable solution for the player would be is to keep repositioning Claire away from these jammed positions, but the way tyrant has certain attacks that can catch and block Claire while trying to rotate at mid-distance, will place her back to that meaty position for unavoidable hit. And depending on Claire's position, the guaranteed hit will either take a ridiculous amount of HP or straight up yeet her off the plane. But unless you're low on ammo and heal items, the fight shouldn't be that bad. And on the other hand, it takes place between a cool transition to the Antarctic transport terminal, where Alfred had set the plane on autopilot mode to automatically take the course to the terminal's location. And while Claire is asleep through the flight, Steve has other ways to kill time. Gotcha.
Considering Capcom are Japanese, I'm not sure if these types of scenarios are romanticized in their media, or if they thought that this is how the audience overseas would perceive intimacy. Or maybe it demonstrates Steve's character as a disgusting teenager. Or it's just a case of the developer fulfilling a dark, twisted fantasy, no beautiful. Well, they try to make it beautiful by adding a soft and warm instrumental, but Steve just gets frustrated, although he does get some action shortly after. Thanks. Yep, he's definitely bricked up. The research facility was built by Alexander Ashford in an abandoned mine located in the Antarctic to cover up the progression of the T. Veronica research advancements from the rest of the competitors in Umbrella, in which he still resides in, imprisoned in a basement as a horrifically mutated version of himself known as Nosferatu. Moving forward, Steve locates an Australian observation base close by, so they decide to use a drilling rig to dig through the ice to escape the facility, only to be stopped by Alfred, who entangles himself in a gunfight with Steve where he gets shot and falls to his death. His fall coincides with Nosferatu breaking free of his shackles, who encounters the duo at the first floor above the ground, rising up after years of imprisonment, and after Claire terminates the mutant and saves Steve from dangling off the side of the roof, they proceed to evacuate the area using a snowcat. But not after one last attempt by Alfred, who wakes Alexia from her cryogenic sleep on his last breath, in a surreal course of events that captures the dark melancholy of Alfred's endeavors, redeeming some empathy to his character, and as he dies in his sister's arms, Alexia kicks off her objectives by destroying the snowcat with giant tentacles that seizes the duo's escape in a display of her new powers. Although the level offers a basic entry to some sectors, it's when Chris gets the opportunity to have a go at him that the map opens up, which is a common design choice in this game to give Chris the access to previously unavailable areas. Dynamically, it plays well, giving the same sense of purpose for the end goal of a level between both characters, although Chris's sections feel generally superior considering they are the absolute version of the same map offering more exploration, variety, and options. But going through a limited version with Claire first gives the opportunity to warm up to these areas without being overwhelmed, especially since areas like the Antarctic Terminal drastically change the second time around. But for now, the destination is the rooftop. Trying to evaluate Nosferatu as a boss fight can be a bit tricky, considering how much of a trouble he can pose heavily correlates to how well equipped the player is, which in return corresponds to the amount of enjoyment to be had out of the encounter. Taking a deeper look, the flaws of this decision starts to surface when the retry checkpoint is located at the same boss arena, locking the ability to go back for the item box to swap for a more convenient gear with larger quantities of ammo. And since Nosferatu takes an ungodly amount of bullets, this scenario could quote-unquote softlock the game. Sure, you can load up a previous save file, but in case that don't exist or it happens to send you so far back that it wipes off hours of progression, this can be a turning point that breaks the playthrough. On the flip side, the optimal way to fight Nosferatu is by using the sniper rifle, left by Alfred after his fall, loaded up with 7 bullets in which Nosferatu needs about 4 dead center in his heart, which I believe is the intended way to take on the fight, even though the rifle pickup is optional. A strenuous third option is by using a knife. While the damage the knife deals in itself is decent enough, the accurate positioning and timing required by the player needs a good amount of practice. Not without a visual compensation though, since two out of the three available termination methods have their own tailored cutscenes respectively, giving a sense of choice that is further expanded on by successfully avoiding the poison spores that Nosferatu sprays during the fight, which later on negates the need to find the serum for Claire during Chris's section. Aesthetically and lore-wise, Nosferatu is an A-tier boss, with somewhat wonky but relatively fair moveset that offers a reasonable challenge on the presumption he is fought optimally with the sniper rifle, or by a knife after a lot of practice. Completing this event marks the beginning of the Chris portion of the game, where Chris arrives to the Rockford Island for Claire's rescue after getting intel on her whereabouts from Leon. On arrival, Chris encounters Rodrigo, who lets him know that Claire has escaped the island via a plane moments before he gets swallowed by the gulpworm. 
Saving Rodrigo will cause him to reward Chris with the lighter he was previously gifted by Claire, just before drawing his last breath. Exploring the underground labs, Chris encounters Whisker, an old teammate of Chris who they've served together in STARS, a special tactics and rescue service, where unbeknown to Chris at the time, Whisker was a double agent working for Umbrella. Their conflict ended with Whisker getting gutted by a tyrant, where he was thought to be dead, but takes a 180 and reappears as a virally enhanced superhuman, where now it's pretty clear that the island invasion was done by an organization called HCF, led by Albert Whisker himself. It seems that their initial bombs caused the leak of the T. Veronica virus, which infected the populace. His goal is to retrieve a host that contains the mentioned virus, aka Alexia, since she's the last carrier of the virus after the death of her brother Alfred. Wesker spares Chris after learning that Alexia resides in the Antarctic facility along with Claire, shifting back to his main goal of going after the sample. Wesker has to be one of the most consistent characters in the franchise. His goals are static along with his motivations. His mono-navigations of his purpose leaves a small room for development in his character arc. On the contrary to characters like Leon, where we see his growth from the inexperienced rookie in Resident Evil 2 to the professional veteran from Resident Evil 4. The effects of this evolution go beyond his job title and competence level, but rather extends to his personality, changing aspects of how he thinks, talks and acts, whom are visibly shown and noticed by the player. In contrast to Wesker, where his tunnel vision goals define the immobility of his character arc and binds him to that role. This characterization isn't necessarily bad if you like Whisker's persona, since you know what you'll be getting from his involvement in the story. But over the course of a few games, his role gets a bit stagnant, necessitating an overall. Although his iteration in Code Veronica X is one of the best additions to the plot and its progression, which for now he heads for the Antarctic, going after Alexia, followed by Chris to the rescue of his sister Claire, nearing a narrative conclusion. Having the controls passed on to Chris, the first notable variation is that all the items in Claire's inventory are non-transferable to Chris, while alternatively, the ones in the item box do, rendering all the items that are specifically in Claire's inventory inaccessible to Chris. Now considering Code Veronica does not have options for choosing difficulty levels, well unless you own the Japanese version, this is the game's way of implementing adaptive difficulty. It's unclear if it was intentional or as intentional as the newer titles, where depending on how well you're doing, the game will adjust some aspects, like enemy spawns and ammo supplies, where in Code Veronica I wouldn't even call it quote-unquote adaptive difficulty, since the mechanic itself does not adapt to anything, but rather the player has to make the best out of what they have in a game-changing decision they are unaware of, unless they have already played and beaten the game before. But to be fair it's not as bad as it sounds, since the game compensates the weaponry drought with new ones that are decently efficient for taking on the upcoming challenges. Unless the upcoming challenges are the albinoid adult, which can be quite tanky without the explosive rounds. The fight takes place in a waterway passage hidden deep in the underground, which used to lead to the mansion where Alexia and Alfred resided, with the latter mentioning that he can never allow the unwashed to see Alexia giving the commonly mediocre stage design a reason to exist, a meaning that changes the aura of the place after knowing its dark hidden past, which is a reminder of how well this game handles perception in a low asset environment. Changing the perception by giving meaning extends beyond the short tales and environments. I mean, by this point, the insects themed subplot becomes more transparent. Ever since the early game, Alexia was shown to have a clear fascination over them, and more specifically with ants and their relationship to their queen. The social structure of the ants is very complex, while individually ants are very simple. Having the ideal ecosystem for survival, where the soldier and worker ants dedicate their lives to serve their queen, their demise can be easily recovered by replacement. On the contrary to the death of their queen, which means the doom of the entire ant hill. On a grander scale, this biosphere will emulate the perfect ecosystem for humans with Alexia taking the queen's role, which launched her initial tests by implanting a queen ant's gene into the mother virus, also known as the T-virus that Spencer found long before, giving her the suitable attributes for the position. 
The insect's theme goes into a deeper symbolization with the dragonfly, which can be seen, referenced, and used throughout the game. The dragonfly metamorphosis stages symbolize change, a change of self, realizing the grander state of existence she will reach in due time. Just like the dragonfly that lives most of its life as a nymph or immature, where it takes ages to then finally reach its ultimate form, portraying a symbol of self that comes with maturity. The addition of creating new dimensions for these backstories and how well they transcribe gives basis to how thoughtful the developers were in inserting these new depths. So, back to the main plot, where now Chris was able to find Claire restrained in what looks to be a green spider web. I'm guessing it was carried out by the giant Black Widow. After rupturing the web, the siblings' reunion gets interrupted by Alexia, where Claire leaves Chris to his whereabouts while she goes after Steve, who has apparently been injected with the T. Veronica virus by Alexia causing him to mutate into this huge rampaging beast, where after getting the opportunity to end Claire, who's been put in a chokehold by Alexia's tentacles, gets some sense of his true self for a moment and slashes Alexia's limb off, causing her to deliver him a fatal blow right before retreating. Drawing his final breath, he apologizes to Claire for not being able to keep his promise as her guardian, followed by confessing his love. Failing to save both of his parents, a teenage Steve made his goal to redeem his incompetence by always protecting Claire, interchanging the quintessence of his parents with Claire's to fill in as a substitute, giving him a goal. A goal he's emotionally invested in and heavily attached to. The redemption arc of his character works well on paper, but as an embodiment of that character, Steve misses all the marks on acting out all these small character intricacies, making him look like this. Shut up! I don't want to talk about it! And play like this. Nasty some of my bitch! While at the same time, Chris is wrangled between Wesker and Alexia. And after the latter mutates to a higher form, Wesker realizes he's in a losing battle and cops out, leaving her pyromanical shenanigans for Chris to handle. Chris is able to knock her out temporarily, giving him time to assemble the wings of the gold dragonfly, which acts as a key to access the reactor core, where in an 80s action movie maneuver, he initiates the self-destruction system which reunites him with Claire, as they both stand for a final showdown with the optimum shape of Alexia, reaching her final form which resembles a mature dragonfly, both physically and metaphorically. Obliterating her with a linear launcher will set the siblings for their escape, only to be stopped by Whisker, who reveals that he got what he came for, as Steve's corpse will provide a sample of the T. Veronica virus. And now all that is left is to have his revenge of eliminating Chris. The two clash into a fight as Claire makes a run for the plane. Well, a fight is an overstatement since Chris gets smacked around, but is able to knock down some hanging girders on Whisker, slowing him down where an explosion breaks, halting further advancements by Whisker, buying Chris some time to escape via the plane along with Claire. The game ends with Chris flying the plane, where he states that he's going for Umbrella next, ending this once and for all an epilogue that concludes the main storyline while leaving some open endings for further installments, a classic finale that's led by an outstanding closing levels. Getting the chance to explore a mansion that partially resembles the Spencer Mansion from Resident Evil 1, as the design was copied from the late George Trevor, who originally designed the latter, and even including a secret passage to a mini version of the Ashford residence where Alexander states that he will be able to cherish his sweet memories there. Inversing these Victorian settings with the industrial ones where they all blend together perfectly while traversing them, accompanied by an 80s action heroic sounding track while having visual clues of what's to come, task these final areas with a sense of urgency that builds proper momentum for the final battle. A final battle that is visually fitting to represent a finale, but plays like a fuck fest with an improbable amount of odds ranging from tentacle slams and poisonous acid spits to a swarm of bugs that are constantly aggressive, paired with no dodging or strafing options to avoid these staggers beside the basic movement controls, leaving Chris immobilized into a constant state of animation locks that gradually eats away at his HP 
And since there is no clear way or an official path to victory, some strategies can offer up a variety of solutions to overcome these odds, which, aside from a few positioning-based hacks like standing in a specific spot to avoid Alexia's tentacles, most of these strats rely on weapon availability and how to use them efficiently like having the double submachine guns for crowd control or the grenade launcher's explosive rounds for widespread damage. But the vastly superior method is to spam Alexia with the gunpowder arrows right from the corner of the stage. I know it feels anticlimactic and cheap, but it's kind of a cheap boss that's unthoughtfully overtuned in difficulty for the developers to think they are leaving an impactful last encounter, taking away some of the adrenaline while building some cortisol, as the final battle can be mentally taxing without the right equipment. But nevertheless, the game manages to keep its ending on a high point that's both pleasing and rewarding. So, there is no doubt that I find Code Veronica to be an amazing game with some of its shortcomings traced back to the capabilities of the hardware, while others consist of ease-of-life mechanics that doesn't quite meet the modern standards for a smooth experience. But the core experience is still phenomenal, with a long and healthy campaign filled with memorable encounters and locations, an out-of-the-box storyline that detours from the customary Resident Evil plots. Having a strong core basis and infrastructure, but hurdled with fashionable decisions of its time and limitations of the hardware, which all can be overhauled to their maximum potential with today's experience of the Resident Evil staff and the hardware they are working with. But unfortunately, looking at the chronological order of the current remakes pattern, there is a decent chance we're getting a Resident Evil 5 remake. And although I love RE5 and spent countless hours playing in it, there is not much to be remade unless they go for core changes like drastically reworking the partner system. The rest of the experience feels and plays like a modern title with minor inconveniences, like not being able to strafe while aiming down sights, in comparison to Code Veronica, which even outside of the previously mentioned reasons, the lack of availability on modern platforms leaves a huge base of potential customers, with no official Windows port and a skewed PS4 one that emulates the PS2 version instead of the remastered PS3 version, with no widescreen support or any real enhancements. And for some reason, purchasing the game from the Europe PlayStation Network gets you the PAL version, which is locked at 25 frames per second. But there is still hope, especially after Capcom made a survey a while back asking players what Resident Evil game they would like to be remade in the future. It's unclear how much this will influence their decision, however, fingers crossed, people choose Code Veronica as the more deserving option. But for now, we're still stuck with this version of Steve, endlessly wandering the Rockford Island graveyard, waiting to rise from the dead.